In the studio in Johannesburg is Andrew Newell, who is from Canon Asset Managers. We're talking about Superdog. Superdog is something we featured many times before on CNBC Africa, uh, but it's quite pertinent at the moment with the uh, the changing conditions, with the South African economy being so, under so much pressure, the oil price um, uh, bouncing back from its uh, record uh, precipitous loss of the last uh, nine months or so, and also the South African rand doing what it's doing. So there are opportunities out there, I think. Andrew, is that the basis of an article that you sent me a couple of days ago which says the following um, companies and management teams need to be flexible agile competitive and entrepreneurial hello Lindsay uh, that's pretty much it and as you say we were all very excited to have a low oil price not that long ago but uh, those days have gone very quickly and the business environment certainly remains as difficult as it has been for some time now whether you're talking about just general GDP growth figures which are disappointing uh, input cost inflation, the RAND, that certainly has caught a lot of attention over the last uh, few days specifically. And what we find is a, an all share index which uh, notwithstanding the very recent past is at high levels. Uh, companies for the most part are expensive on a range of multiples but there are some companies which are doing relatively well from a commercial perspective and are still reasonably uh, attractively priced. We've got a universe, uh, a, a share picking universe that is quite small compared to, uh, for example, you know, the S&P 500 or the New York Stock Exchange, whichever you want to look at. <clears throat> Excuse me. But on the other hand, there are some stocks that are relatively ignored. And when you, when you said relatively earlier on when it came to valuation, what did you mean? Well, if you consider the, the broader market, the Aussie at the moment, it's on a price earnings ratio of about 19, give or take. Uh, there are a number of companies that we've identified which are uh, either still in the single digits or in the early double digits and that's uh, relatively attractive and absolutely attractive as well. Uh, those are the two things you want. So you, you could find that you are better than your peers but equally you want to be a, an attractive business in your own right also. Do you find that the South African CEO, the South African board, during times like the time that we have just experienced and are experiencing, are uh, more nimble than other boards, for example, because we keep on going through these, these little cycles of ours where we have this, this crisis and that crisis, and therefore when the good times come, they are more ready to take advantage of them? Yeah, I, th I think for a business in South Africa to uh, either have done well or to be still doing well, you do need a, a management board which is... Uh, flexible, nimble, uh, has the discretion to do some interesting things because as you note we do go, f it seems certainly from one crisis to the next, some of those are controllable, uh, some of them are not and what you really want is a management team that can steer or guide their, their ship so to speak through these different business cycles. Uh, we go through good times as much as bad. It's difficult to remember that we had some good times recently uh, when, when we're in an environment like this. But uh, in good times, it's not that hard to do well. When we're going through some tricky waters like now, you do need, a, a, I think, a, a well-engaged, sensible, entrepreneurial uh, and disciplined management team. And that's really what we've set out to, to try and uncover. Well, let's have a look at the uncovering uh, process now. What have you got in your portfolio? Is there anything that is new since we last spoke? There are a couple of new positions and what we're finding, you know, before I come to a couple of stocks, uh, more thematically is given the, the high levels of the RAND, the uncertainty around the country, there does seem to be a very healthy appetite amongst South African investors for companies that have earnings outside of South Africa, whether it's all or some of their earnings and I suppose diversified earnings drivers. That most commonly comes in the flavor of things like SAB Miller, uh, Richemont, uh, to a lesser degree uh, Aspen, uh, but increasingly so. Some of the retailers going to South Africa. But what we found is some of these smaller companies have very quietly expanded or diversified their earnings base so that they are increasingly outside of South Africa. I don't think that's necessarily to say that one must exit South Africa by any stretch, but it does recognize that you are exposed to single risk or single country risk at least by being in South Africa and there are a few of these co uh, companies around. So if we come to some examples, uh, one of the larger ones in the portfolio is a company called Mete. That's not particularly new, we've held it for some time, but it's a great example of 
a business which has slowly and steadily diversified its earnings away from South Africa. Uh, as you probably know, they're involved in the, the start-stop battery industry primarily. And they now have, have operations in Romania as well as Turkey, and those are doing very well for them. Uh, on a smaller scale and probably newer to, to the portfolio are logistics-oriented businesses, OneLogix and Santova, which fits in the same camp. One Logics has had a bit of a tricky year so far, um, but it remains a, a very competitive business. It's got some interesting uh, attributes to it, and it uses the, the different assets that it has uh, very sensibly. Uh, some of the others, and, and this might surprise uh, either you or the viewers, a company like Robex. <laughs> and, you know, we're all aware of the, the, the sort of treacherous environment that construction has been through for a few years, and it continues to be there. Uh, Robex is involved primarily with uh, the road construction industry, but also uh, we're supplying to the, the broader construction industry and the mining industry. And what we like here is they've been quite successful in taking on projects where they're able to get some payment up front, then do some work, get some more payment, do some more work. And I think that's where the smaller construction firms came under specific pressure over the last few years, where there was a lack of payment or no payment, and a smaller business often just doesn't have the, the balance sheet to, to weather that storm. So that's something a bit different as well. Are those bigger construction companies unable to cope with the fact that uh, margins have gone down from 6 to 3.5 uh, to 4%, to and whereas companies like Robex, which are not right up there with the big boys that were involved in all the scandals, they, they can't cope with it. C can Robex do so and be, as you say in your, in your paragraph that I read earlier on, nimble and more entrepreneurial? Yeah, I think that's exactly it. They can be more nimble and entrepreneurial. They can also be a, a successful business looking at smaller projects. You'll find that the big companies uh, are naturally bigger, but they're looking at bigger projects. And the competition in those projects is stiffer. And as you note, the, the margins are compressed. They've at least halved um, from a few years ago, perhaps even more in places. But equally, they're facing stiff competition from, uh, from overseas uh, competitors as well, the Chinese most notably and that really has put them under some significant pressure. There are other interesting companies as well that we've introduced to the portfolio. One uh, which in the very near term has struggled from a price perspective is Rolfs. Um, but this is an interesting business. It's certainly not the most glamorous company on the stock exchange, I think it's fair to say that. But what they have is a, an interesting, principally pigments and chemicals business, which is doing okay. Uh, but they're moving into the agricultural and water industries where they've uh, been getting their, their feet wet. Uh, and that's something which thematically is also a very interesting proposition. Talking about the companies that are going overseas, I mean, when you talk about the smaller companies doing it on a sort of quietly below the radar, if you like, there we saw Mr. Price uh, just last week, I think it was, when their results came out. And this is a massive, massive company. It's got a market capitalization of close to 40 billion. It's got turnover of 18.1 billion. And suddenly it says we're opening uh, stores in Australia, sort of following the Woolworths model. But um, you can't really count on these things. And when I see another paragraph, which I'm going to quote, now, uh, you come up with a Warren Buffett quote. You say, we never want to count on the kindness of strangers in order to meet tomorrow's obligations. In the same way, we never want companies to bank on changing conditions when the time to do uh, business is now. And this comes to the South African RAND. This is a game changer to me over the, over the last week, what has happened. The RAND in the 1260s and um, yeah, in the uh, early 19s against the British pound. Are there companies that you've identified uh, that have started to go beyond our borders that will really benefit from what we're seeing on the currencies market? Well, I think any company that has a meaningful offshore earnings base uh, will, will naturally benefit from a weaker currency. The recent uh, very sharp weakness in the RAND will uh, filter into those earnings numbers quite quickly. But I think the point we're trying to make there, Lindsay, is as much as that is uh, as part of the deal, you know, you're looking to go offshore to diversify away from South Africa. Management teams would do very well to remember that they didn't know the RAND would suddenly be at 1250 something uh, at the end of last week. Uh, it could get worse, but equally, there's every chance that it could get better. The point is for them to diversify their earnings base. They'll look very clever if the RAND uh, stays at these weak levels. 
Uh, but if it does turn around, and let's not forget that the Rand is one of the most volatile currencies in the world, it will hurt them. And the point we're trying to make is, if you think your business will do well because the Rand will weaken, uh, that might be true today, but when the Rand weakens, you better have a different plan. A, a bigger point, when the Rand strengthens, you need to have a different plan. Absolutely, you must. Uh, is it quite interesting going out there, Andrew, and having a look, look at companies that are not featured on CNBC Africa and in the mainstream media every single day, and, and, and as you say, uncovering these, these gems? Do you ever say to yourself, goodness me, I'm quite excited about what I've just seen and that meeting I've just had? Absolutely. And, you know, the, that's the most exciting part. I think the, the area where one needs to uh, sort of temper your, your enthusiasm or your expectations is to say that these companies are smaller, they are less well known. And as a result, you do need to be very diligent about going and uh, assessing the business. What is it that makes it unique? Is it sustainable? Uh, does it have an armory uh, or a balance sheet that can get through difficult times? Because this does happen to all companies, big and small. The, the thing as, a, as an attribute that we really are drawn to is the companies that investors are excited by, as I mentioned earlier, the SAB Millers, uh, the Richemonts, you can find those attributes but at a far better price. And that's really how they make their way into our Superdogs portfolio. They're good businesses. Uh, they might not be glamorous, but they are well run and they've got some, uh, some stability, I suppose, in the, in the nuts and bolts. Who should be investing in Superdogs? Somebody who's unglamorous, someone who uh, doesn't really want to uh, you know, just go with the normal flow of the Naspers and the, the Steinhoff, someone who wants to embellish his or her, her portfolio with something slightly different? Lindsay, I would never call any of our clients unglamorous, <laughs> but I know what you mean. And uh, where Superdogs really aims to fit in is it is very different to the market in its makeup. Uh, it will behave very differently to the, markup, uh, the market. And for that reason, it probably shouldn't be the core of anyone's investment portfolio, but rather what it does is it adds itself or lends itself to being a very interesting uh, satellite. It's a word often used in the investment industry. How big a satellite should be is open to, but to debate uh, 10, 15 or 20 percent of an equity portfolio, perhaps. But investors need to be aware that if the market goes up by five or down by three, superdogs may or may not follow that behavior. That's the point, but you do need to get that in your head first and accept that it will look different to the market. And of course, uh, apart from the fact that it's different to most of the other mainstream funds, uh, it also uh, has the opportunity, I suppose, to uncover that uh, 10, 15 or 20 bag or so-called that uh, most people uh, continue to look for. Andrew, thank you very much for your time this evening. That's Andrew Newell, who's a fund manager at Canon Asset Managers. That's it for Money Manager.